Well, let's go ahead and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. And the title of the study is A Call to Humility. We're going to see the humility that the Lord wants his leadership of the church to walk in. He's going to talk to those that are in the congregation to respond to that leadership and to walk humbly. He's then going to say, all of you be humble and walk in humility with each other. And then we'll close by just seeing that we need to be humble before the Lord. So here we have it, a call to humility. We begin at verse one. It says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So these opening four verses are going to speak to the elders and um, the way in which they are to govern in humility, the way they are to lead. So we begin here by just seeing and noting that elders govern the affairs of the church. This is the Lord's plan. He appoints men to lead the church. And this can go back, we can see it all the way back into the earliest days of the church when Paul and Barnabas were out doing mission work in Acts 14, 23. We read, so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So this was the plan, is that every little uh, church, every little congregation that was being established, of course, there in Jerusalem, it was no little church. It was thousands. I mean, one day, you know, 3,000 and men got saved. So they went from zero to, you know, whatever, 6,000 in one day. Um, and so it was a, a super large church. But in a lot of the other places, they were home, house churches. And so um, they appointed elders in each of these locations. Elders are those who are mature with wisdom and qualified, qualified to make godly decisions. Uh, normally, um, as this word was used in, in the general course of affairs, it would have been referring to those that were also older in age. But as we move through the scriptures, we see that guys like Timothy and Titus, um, young guys, were actually not only elders, but they were appointing elders. So this is the important piece. It's the character of, of the leaders. It's the call of God upon their life. You know, when we go through scripture, um, what you see the emphasis on in the leadership of the church is on the character of the men that are leading and not so much on the form and the structure. Um, this is why you can find that there are many different forms and structure of church congregation, um, uh, of church government over the congregation. And so um, each, every, every, whatever you adopt, whatever perspective you take. Um, obviously, that group of believers, those are believing that's the best way for that to take place. Um, I think one, one thing that's probably not a healthy way to do this is to say, well, this, this method or this approach, it allows for people to become carnal and ungodly. Therefore, we're not going to do it. The Bible's already addressed that and that it should be men of character. It should be godly men. And it doesn't matter what form of government you have. If somebody is willing to defy the living God of the universe, I don't think they care much about the structure of the church government to walk in their sin. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, accountability is great, and we have it here, but let's not overdo it. If I'm not accountable to God, do you think I'm going to be accountable to you? And if you're not accountable to God, do you think you're going to be accountable to, to me? I mean, this is, this is the problem. So it's knowing who is in charge and where my role and my position should be. But let me just talk for a moment about how that functions here. So for us, um, I serve as, as, one, as a lead elder, you could say. And we have elders who serve as, on staff as pastors. And we have elders who are part of the board of directors, kind of that legal arm and the financial arm, making um, those decisions about purchases and, and overseeing the doctrine of the church, um, keeping an eye on, on the character um, of 
whoever holds this position and the others. So there's this, the accountability is in place in that way. But I do have the freedom to lead the church when it comes to matters of, um, uh, fine, uh, of uh, like vision for the church, uh, what I'm going to be teaching on, as long as it accords with the, the stated doctrinal statement. I have the authority to, to lead the staff um, and the direction of ministry. But I have to be, and I am accountable, have equal say when it comes to matters of finances. Uh, we've already established the doctrine, so I don't get to go changing that, and nor will the, the next guy, should the Lord tarry, and I go. Um, so this is um, how we function, and I have to say, it functions really, really beautifully. I know a lot of you don't get to see this behind-the-scenes stuff, but I can tell you that um, what is usually um, the case in church and the leadership is that they're striving and arguing and fighting and contention. And that's not, that's not the case. Praise the Lord. We actually all like each other. And we enjoy spending time with each other. So praise the Lord for that. Um, elders, there are two, you, two words. And actually, I'll say three words that are used. But the two main words are the Greek words, um, episkopos, from where we get episcopalian, and presbyteros, where we get our word presbytery. So these are the two words that are used, and they are translated, um, well, episcopal, a uh, form of episcopos, is translated in some places overseer, but it's also translated as elder, and the word presbyteros is also translated elder. So they're synonymous terms for the same work. Um, read 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 19, and if you do a little bit of uh, word study there, you will see that they're used, different Greek words, but using and translated the same way into the English language. So this is, this is the form. And there are other forms of government, the congregational, where the, the congregation is making the decisions and the vote goes to them. You have um, the one where you have a person who is making all the decisions, and, um, and there's very little accountability. And then um, you have the other one where it's a group of elders and they all are having equal say on all matters. We would be a hybrid of those two. But as we, we move on, um, just, I think the important thing to see here is that God wants his church to function in an orderly manner. And he's put men in that place. I'm not going to get into the whole discussion about women in leadership. I've talked about that through the pastoral epistles, but I do believe that it, it is men um, that hold this position. The Greek word is masculine in both cases. Um, and so it would refer to men. It also says those that are elders should be the husband of one wife. The expectation is that it was going to be men. And um, I realize there's arguments out there and I've studied them and I've read them and I'm just, I'm just not convinced of them. That being said, um, I don't want to be a part of a church where ladies are not serving. I don't want to be a part of a church where women are not walking and they're gifting and being used um, because that would be a... Um, <laughs> that would not be a good church to be a part of. Um, we want everybody to step up and to use their giftedness. It's just, just like in the, the marriage. There's somebody who's going to lead. In the church, there's somebody who's going to lead. And so it's not a statement of uh, who's better. It's a statement of the order that God adopted. So as we move on, we see in verse 2, it says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. So here's the third word. And um, it's a word um, here, shepherd, it's a verb form. Um, and it's uh, the word poimino, poimano. And um, the noun form of that verb is um, poimen. So you can hear the, the similarity between them. One is a noun, one is a verb. One is describing what that man is to do. And the other one is describing that position. So I would say from Ephesians 4.11, where it talks about the giftings, and it does not refer to um, an elder, but it does refer to pastor teacher, that I would say all three of these terms are, are synonymous terms that are, are being used. Uh, many would disagree with that, but that's, that's my take on, on this. So what are the functions involved in shepherding? Shepherd the flock which is among you. Well, what, what does that entail? Well, well, the first job is to feed the sheep. Um, it, read John 21, 15 through 17, and you'll find both of the, the exhortations that Jesus gives is to feed the sheep and tend to the sheep. 
Feeding, of course, has to do with putting out the word of God and giving you um, the reading of scriptures and the study of scriptures and the application of scripture, exhorting, encouraging you as well as myself to be in obedience to this. In the early church, Acts chapter six, when the church was growing and expanding, there was some division that arose between the Hellenist Jews, Greek-speaking Jews who had become believers and they were widows, and the Hebrew-speaking uh, that had um, become believers. Um, and there was this argument that the Hebrew widows were getting a greater allotment of the daily distribution of food than the, the Greek-speaking. And so they brought this to Peter and he says, find some guys that can handle this problem, good men, men of character, full of the Holy Spirit, let them handle it, but I'm going to give myself to prayer and to teaching. And so we see the importance of the teaching of the Word of God, and that this is what should be done. Studying the scriptures to understand them. Studying the scriptures to be able to make application in the right moment at the right time. So it isn't just getting up and, and um, you know, spouting off what, you know, somebody else had to say. I was, actually, there was an individual who said, he goes, I don't understand why you spend so much time um, studying. He goes, there's pe pastors who have been preaching sermons for 2,000 years. Can't you just go find one and preach it and spend your time doing other stuff? I'm like, yeah, I could, but then I would have to stand before Jesus, and I don't think I want to do that. I want to hear from the Lord. I want to rightly divide the word of truth. And then I also want to make that proper application into your life for what is happening in the life of the church. And also those Holy Spirit, those prophetic words that are, speak right to your life, right where you are and the challenges. And I don't always know that, but the Holy Spirit does. And he can give that guidance and direction. And then the tending, which is the protecting, the guiding, the nurturing, and the caring for the sheep. Again, John 21, 15 through 17 emphasizes that this is what a pastor should be doing. And, you know, what we also see there is that it goes on to say serving as overseers. Okay, so that's the word. Um, episcopeo, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain. So notice the phrase, which is among you, which is to tell us that the leadership of the church should never be above the flock, but among the flock. And there's this tradition that's come down through the ages and in some, in many churches where the pastor, the elders are above everybody else because of their, their leadership position, and then they distance themselves and they're not involved with the life of the body. Now, obviously, with the amount of people that come here, I, can't, I don't know all of your names, and I probably have walked by you at a restaurant or something, and you're like, he doesn't even know me. I apologize, I don't know you. Um, but come up and introduce yourself. Maybe I'll remember next time. But, you know, when we first started 30 years ago, I could fellowship with everybody in about two minutes. It was very easy, and, I, and it was very comfortable to, to have that, and there was something sweet and beautiful about that. But, you know, the Lord is the one who builds his church, and so things have changed, and we have a lot of people that serve. Um, and so I get to know some of you, and I get to be involved with some of, of your lives. And, and so I always try to, you know, be available after every single, you know, service. You see me up here or out there on Wednesday night, um, you know, and... You know, the staff, we stay around. I probably stay around much to the disappointment of the staff too long because they want to get home because they got to get back here earlier. But I, you know, this is, this is who we are. We're making ourselves available and to be able to know what's happening in your lives. So shepherds are around sheep. That makes sense, right? Doesn't it? So what we go on to see, though, is in verse 2 still is that to oversee the people of God. This is the responsibility. You shepherd the people of God. You oversee the people of God. The word overseer, um, I just share with you, it's the Greek word episkopeo. But if you break it down, it's epi, which is the first part of that word, which is a preposition, means upon. Um, and scopeo, probably where we get our word scope from, means to look or to observe or to regard. And so the word means to look upon or to look over. And that is the responsibility of the leadership of the church. What do they do? They look over. What are they looking over? Well, they're looking over um, the state and the health to make certain that needs are being met. They're looking over to um, drive out false doctrine when it comes up. Hasn't been a lot of that, but certainly we have had to do that. Um, 
to, when there are people that are causing trouble and division in the church um, to try and resolve that, um, when there's leaven in the church to call that to repentance. And, and so this is it, it's to, it's to speak the word of the Lord, to love. And, you know, this is something that is just my job. And um, I love it, I count it as ministry, but this is just my, my job. And uh, some people will look and say, dealing with the false doctrine and really teaching the word and, and dealing with divisive people or making sure the leaven's dealt with is like, man, we're so, you know, you're, you're courageous. I don't count myself courageous for doing my job. That's just what I'm supposed to do. And I can tell you for the leadership of the church here, when we think about, you know, there's a bad teaching that's come up and we got to go talk to this individual or there's somebody that's causing division and there's life, there's no hesitancy on our part. We're not saying, well, what's going to be the impact? Is this going to upset people? That's not our, our, our problem. Our problem is to do what the Lord has called us to do and make sure we're obedient to that. And if you ever have a desire to go and be a pastor or a leader, you step into that position, please do what the word of the Lord tells you to do. And don't sit and ponder whether you should do that or not. I think there's a lot of pastors because of the response we see in society and the way people get so angry and they get so upset at you know the teaching of the word of God or... Um, if you ask a person who's causing trouble or the living in sin to, to get it straight, well, this is not going to make people happy. But what about the Lord? And what about everybody else? You know, this is what I, I believe. There's pastors that are unwilling to speak things they actually believe the Bible teaches because they don't want to touch the controversial issue. Now listen, I'm not one that wants to go get on a hobby horse and swing, you know, you know, at the pinata every single Sunday because it's a controversial issue, okay? I don't need to pick fights, but if it comes up in the Word of God, we're going to teach it. But these who are afraid, maybe they actually believe exactly um, as we would believe if you were to ask them, but they've chosen not to speak about these controversial issues that the Bible clearly addresses because they're afraid it's just going to cause problems. And so they're silent about it. But let me tell you, you are causing a problem because you guys are dealing in the midst of the controversy. You're living it at your workplace, among your families. And so for me to now stand up and say, well, I don't want to talk about it because this is going to be controversial. Well, what about the flock who's in the midst of the controversy? They're, you're, you're walking through difficult times and now your pastor's unwilling to speak Stand up and lovingly speak the word of the Lord to you and talk about what the, what the Bible has to say. I think these pastors are making a huge mistake because the church of Jesus Christ, you are wired to want to know the truth. And so the truth should be given. And so if anybody's out there as a pastor is afraid to talk about these controversial issues, be afraid not to talk about it. That's where the fear should lie. And that doesn't mean with red face and veins popping out, but that you lovingly address the issues because the congregation, the flock of God, is living it out in their, in their lives. So oversee. This is what it is to protect. Now, in verses 2 and 3, you see the character and the heart of the elders. And I'm going to move through this quickly. Um, first of all, you see the elders are to serve willingly, not by compulsion, but willingly. It's a privilege and honor to hold that position. And if you find yourself in a place where that is your position and you're, you're begrudging that call and those limitations that, that come upon your life to walk and to serve in this way, then Change your heart or give it over because it's a honor and a privilege. Remember, Peter says that he, Jesus, suffered for the church. And so this suffering for the church um, should be accounted a privilege to be able to take care of that which Jesus suffered for. Still in verse 2, the elders should not be self-serving. Those who serve for what they could gain, again, quit. Stop, repent, don't do that any longer. Whether it be for money or for recognition or serving some you know, purpose of, of your own, this is not the reason for the position. 
when I was in a seminary back in Australia as a pretty young guy. Um, and I remember it was in between classes and these two guys, they were young, but they're older than me. And I remember one guy saying to another, he says, you know what, I cannot wait until I'm a, the, the senior pastor and I can stop having people tell me what to do and I can start having, telling them what to do. And I turned to them to expect somebody to go, ha, 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 but they didn't do that. The other guy said, yeah, me too. I was just like, wow. That is not the position. To be a leader in the church means you serve first. That's what that means. And we see that elders are not to lord over the flock, right? Well, it also says, but not for uh, dishonest gain. So you're not looking for, um, you know, trying to take advantage of the church financially, but not, nor being lords to those entrusted you. Jesus taught in Luke 22 that we should be servants. Don't do it the way the world does it. And, you know, in Luke 22, he says that this is something that you should do. So you should seek to be a servant. And Acts, no, John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, at the Last Supper, Jesus serves them. He gets up from the table and he washes their feet. And um, this is significant because the person who washed feet was to be the person who was the least in that household. So if you had five servants, servant number five would do it. If he was in the field, then number four, three, two, one, or your youngest capable child, or your wife, or you. And that's kind of the way it went. So when they went into the house and there was not the washing of feet, um, the reason is, the backdrop, if you follow the context, is they had been fighting earlier that week. Do you know what they were fighting over? Who's the greatest? So culturally speaking, for them to get up and wash feet would have been an admission that they're not the greatest. But that's according to the world's thinking. But God's kingdom is, well, I was going to say upside down, but it's really, it's the right side up and everything else is upside down. So this is, the, the, the model is that Jesus was a servant. He did not lord. He didn't stick his foot out and say, excuse me, do you somebody forget something here? You know, who's going to wash the feet? And it's like, they're all like, I'm, I'm washing feet because then they're going to think I am the least in this crowd. So Jesus gave us that example. And we also see there in verse 3, the elders are examples on how to live the Christian life. So you should be able to look at those that are uh, pastoring, those that are um, the elders, um, and you should look and say, that's how to do life. That doesn't mean we're perfect, okay? We're a, we're a work in progress, but it should mean that at my life, you should be able to be observed and should be able to be followed. In verse four, he reminds them that the chief shepherd is going to return and they will stand before him and give an account for the way in which they have done their job. If they've done it well, they're gonna receive a crown of glory, just like you. If you do well, those things that the Lord has called you to do, you will receive a crown of glory. And I mean, that is going to be an amazing moment in heaven to see the Lord stand to his feet and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, and to give this crown to those who have faithfully served the chief shepherd. Wow. Um, that kind of sets a perspective on how and what we do in all of our life. Moving on into verse 5. The subject changes from the elders. The elders are to walk in this humility, serving, not for gain, and, and, and doing it as unto the Lord. Now he's going to speak to uh, the church and how they should be walking in humility towards the leaders. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Now, this is true for all people in the church, not just the younger people. But maybe the problem here is that the younger people were you know, kind of bucking the system a little bit. And so he addresses them. There's not much to go on. Um, that may not be the case. Maybe there's another reason that we are unaware of. But just as the leadership of the church should walk in humility, the church should walk in humility following the leaders. The Bible places a heavy responsibility upon church leaders, but it also addresses the responsibility of every one of you to be in the congregation, to be in submission. He says, submit yourself to your elders. Uh, humility is manifested in submission to church leadership. Certainly not the only area, but in this context, this here it is. Um, and the word submit is a word that would, was primarily used in secular 
uh, circles to describe an army that would take battle formation. So the general, let's say, gives the, the battle plan and they want to flank. Well, then there's gonna, they're going to take formation to flank. Or maybe it's, a, you know, attack the walls or maybe whatever it is. They are to line up in an orderly fashion under the command of that leadership. And that is the word that is used here. But that it is not just young people that are to su submit to the leadership is evident. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So while I'm going to be held to a stricter judgment of how I've led and how I've served you and what I've taught and how I've cared for you, you're going to be held accountable for how you have followed the leadership of the church, whatever church um, is your home church. And I just want to encourage you, if you have leadership that feeds you and tends you uh, to your care and is walking in, in sound doctrine, I don't know that there's much to complain about. Those are the keys. Those are, there's going to be preferences. There, some of you don't like the Saturday night. Okay, you don't like the Saturday night. But is it doctrinally wrong? Is it morally out of place? Is it unloving? Well, listen, I can tell you the only reason we're doing it is because we feel like it'll better serve and it'll alleviate some of the stress and the, you know, the crowding on Saturday, uh, Sunday morning. So the decision was made there. You may not like the decision. You maybe should have thought that we, you know, did it a different time. I don't know. Maybe you're right. We're all going to find out real soon. <laughs> But, um, you know, th so this is, this is how we have, have gone about making that decision. Be, be so vigilant to not allow petty differences to divide. He says to be... Um, In, in verse 5, we move on. He says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another. So now we move from the church to all of our relationships and that we should be submissive to one another and we should be clothed with humility. That word clothed is a word, it's a rare word, and it was used of a slave putting on an apron and getting ready to serve. It's the word that is used in John 13 when it says that Jesus stood, stood up and girded himself with the cloth. This is the same word. We all should be girded, ready to do, if you will, the lowest job, which is hard to call anything that we touch in the kingdom of God low. What's low? Because it's all above our pay grade. It's all well beyond anything we should be able to even think about doing. To lay the, our hands on the plow of Jesus in any capacity in the field is more favor and kindness than any of us deserve. Who are we to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? So I say low, but probably not really that right word. But, the, but it does communicate those things that we should be willing to do. And a few weeks ago, I said, hey, I think we're going to need about 80 people to serve on Saturday night to make sure we do children's ministry and youth and all of these areas. We've had over 90 of you respond to say, I'm going to help. Thank you. You clothed yourself. You put on that apron and said, I'm willing to serve. And if you're like, Oh, man, I knew I should have. Well, it's not too late. You can still serve. There's all kinds of areas where you can serve within the body of Christ. And, and this is what a humble person does. Is you see the needs around you, and you seek to be one that's in submission to meet the needs. Well, in verse 5, continuing, we see that um, he goes on to say, of course, clothe yourself in humility, And then gives us a really good reason to do that. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud person. So who's the proud person? The one who does not humble themselves and serve. Exactly. You don't like that? You got the scriptures to deal with. This is, I mean, he's like, well, you're just saying that because you have a tons of needs. I just told you we had 90 of you respond. That's not, it's not the point. I'm not aiming and trying to get a, listen, You'll never find the leadership of the church trying to strong arm you into serving Jesus. You know why? Because you don't, should not serve grudgingly, but willingly. And it should be an amazing thing that any of us get to do that. So we're not going to trap you into serving. We'll exhort you and encourage you in the word of the Lord, but beyond that. So God resists the proud. This word resist is so much stronger than what you see here. The word resist means to, 
to oppose or set in ba- to set in uh, battle array against it. Don't be that person that has the Lord setting himself against you. Let him let be one that is trusting the Lord and, and submitting yourself to him. Have that humble stance and consider the benefits of, of this humility, the grace that God says he's going to give to those who uh, walk this way. Um, and there's three benefits I want to talk about. So we're, uh, we're right now we're under, in verse five, where God desires to give grace, but grace to the humble. Um, he gives wisdom, he gives honor, and he gives revival. Wisdom, as Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. That's a good reason to clothe yourself in humility, is to know how to live in difficult times. Also, honor, Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. It's, it's taking a low place and allowing the Lord to lift you up. And if you're like, ah, I'm above all that stuff, then the Lord's not going to lift you up. You can lift yourself up, but he's going to bring you down. And then revival is in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And that is what needs to happen. So there's a darkness in the land. Then there's a brokenness and humility over the sin. And the Lord responds to that brokenness and humility and says, I'm going to heal. And this is true not only for the nation of Israel to whom that promise is given, but it's true to us. If you've made a mess of things, humble yourself before God. Don't make any excuses. Just own it completely. And watch how the Lord will respond to you. He is a softy when it comes to humility. As a matter of fact, he can't resist it. This is what the word of God says, that a broken and contrite spirit he cannot despise. He always comes to the broken. He always comes to the humble that he might give grace. And that grace is manifested in at least three ways, wisdom, honor, and revival. In verse 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Choose humility. I say choose humility because there's one of two ways you can be made humble. You can either come before the Lord and make yourself one that is dependent upon him, or you can be independent. You know what the great sin of the church of Laodicea is? They said that they were in need of nothing. That's what that was pride. We have need of nothing. And the Lord says, oh, I disagree. You are poor, miserable, blind, and naked. They did not see their spiritual state and their need for the Lord. And so the Lord, when he sees somebody whose heart is lifted up, he can humble them. But here, it's you make the decision to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Well, where's that button? <laughs> where's the humble button? Well, I'm just, I'm just, my character, I'm just not a humble person. I'm a proud person. No, that's not like something you're born with. All of us are proud because we are sinners that have rebelled against God. And so we are to choose humility. How do I do that? Well, it begins with under the mighty hand of God. You need to be in the presence of the Lord. You need to be in that place where you are experiencing him. Knowing the consequences of pride should cause me to choose humility. And humility, listen to this, probably the most important thing I'm going to say the whole service. Humility can only be found in the presence of God. I cannot produce humility in you. I can shame you, but I can't humble you. And you can't humble me, you can shame me. And they are not the same thing. Because when you shame somebody, you've just made an enemy. When a person is humbled, that's a totally different story. And it's the Lord who brings humility into our lives. And Isaiah, the opening chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah says, woe is this people. He repeatedly says, woe is this people. Until you get to Isaiah chapter 6, and then Isaiah, when he sees the Lord high and lifted up, he says, woe is what? Woe is me. So he had seen the people in their sin and he said, woe is this people. And he was right. They were a woeful people. But then in the presence of God, 
He saw his glory and his majesty. He saw the mighty hand of God and he said, woe is me. And this is a place where we all need to live. It's another name for this is called being broken in spirit. Blessed are those who are broken in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first act of a relationship with the Lord is one of brokenness and humbling ourselves before the Lord. And so you need not fear this broken, this breaking that the Lord will bring into your life and this humbling that will bring into your life because what's the goal of God in doing that? It's to exalt you and is to raise you up. This is the heart of the Lord. We close there in verse seven and we see that we should cast all our care upon him for he cares for you. Humility looks to God for help. We sang in that last worship song that our father has everything. He takes care of the sparrow, but he takes care of me. And I call upon him. I'm not afraid to come to him. Humility looks to God for help. And the first, and I mentioned this just a second ago, the first act of humility is to look to God for help for salvation. You can't do it. I can't do it on my own. I cannot have a right standing with the Lord based on my own efforts. So I am humbled by my sinfulness. And I say, Lord, please have mercy upon me and forgive me. And he floods us with the grace of the righteousness of God, making us acceptable in the presence of the Lord. And maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never come to the Lord and humbled yourself. You need to do that today. You need to come and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. But when you see the majesty and the mighty hand of God, then you will. But as long as you are large in your eyes, you will never be humble. That's when you become small in your eyes. I, I don't mean beating yourself up and saying you're worthless and you're no good and you're always been a failure. That, that's, that's something else. That's a different discussion. We're talking about seeing the majesty and the beauty of God and then looking at yourself and saying, I am nothing compared to him. And I need his grace and mercy upon. So casting all your care upon him, beginning with your salvation, for he cares for you. So you trust him for your finances. You trust him in your marriage. Meaning you find out what the Bible says about how to do marriage and how to lead your kids and how to handle your finances and how to deal with those that have treated you poorly. In all aspects, I trust the word of the Lord and I cast my care upon him in the guidance and the direction he gives my life because I know that he cares for me. How do I know that? Well, we began in verse five, verse one. It says, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, he suffered for you. He has proven his care and his love for each and every one of us. I want to give us a chance to respond and worship team can come on out and in this song, a chance for you to respond to the Lord. I'm going to get ready for baptism. We're going to come back out and we'll spend some time watching these who are being baptized. We want you to stay close, stay here as we wait upon the Lord um, and uh, celebrate these that have taken a step of faith. But let's first, let's talk about this. You know, maybe you're in a place of leadership and you're not walking in humility. Or you're in that place of following leadership and you're not walking in humility or in your marriage or at work or in the community. There's not humility. And most significantly, you're not humbling yourself before the mighty hand of God. Maybe you're shaking your fist at the mighty hand of God. Not a good idea. Let's humble ourselves before the Lord, meaning let's exalt him and see his greatness and let's see our smallness in light of that beauty. Father, thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you're watching over us, that you suffered for us. Lord, help us to walk in humility with each other, with the leadership that you place over us. Walk in humility, Lord, in the position of leadership, whether that be as a, an elder or be a mom or dad or be a boss or wherever our influence is, may we learn that we are to be those who who serve first as leaders. I'll just give you a moment to respond and to pray. And if you need to come to the Lord and ask for salvation, do that. That is the first humbling experience you'll have is to say, I can't do this. I am not a good enough person to get to heaven. I need the Lord. And he will exalt you in due time. You're gonna have that day in heaven with the Lord.